Hi, welcome to the Oxford Robotics Institute and welcome to our event, which is going to show you a little bit about how autonomous robots perceive and think and interact with the world. My name is Nick Hawes. I'm a professor here at the Robotics Lab and I uh, am part of a team of, of eight academics, eight faculty members that work on all aspects of robotics, from constructing them, how they're built, how they physically interact the, with the world, and how they learn and how they make decisions. So we work on robotics from things that explore mines to things that go in, robots are going to kind of nuclear, dangerous environments, uh, to drones, to interactive robots, to care robots, all sorts of different things. So we need to understand this real breadth of capability in order to be able to put these kinds of robots together. So uh, before I go any further, I just want to tell you that your cameras, if you've not used Zoom in this configuration before, your camera and your mics will be switched off. So we can't see you, we can't hear you. You should just be able to hear us. But we're going to take a Q&A at the end. So we're going to take your questions. So if any questions occur to you throughout the, all the other things you hear, please type them into the chat. So you'll have a chat to the panelists, which will then go through the questions at the end and uh, answer some of the ones that, that jump at us. So please make sure you engage with us on the chat and we can, we can come to your questions later. Also, if any of this stuff interests you and you wanna see our robots out in the wild and other things they do, then you can visit our website, you can visit us on YouTube. So just have a web search for the Oxford Robotics Institute and you'll find all of those things. So the event we're gonna to have today, it's gonna to start with a bit of a tour of the robotics lab of our experimental area, which is behind us. And then we're gonna have two uh, talks from other academics presenting different aspects of some of their research. So kind of really cutting edge things that will describe some of the research work going on here. And then we'll finish with the most exciting bit of all, which will be a, a quadruped robot tackling that salt course uh, autonomously, which will be round in the corner in the lab behind me. Okay, so let's get started with the tour. So I'm gonna start walking this way and hopefully the camera comes with me. Um, so this is the main experimental area and kind of maintenance and manufacturing part of the lab. So we're going to see some, some exciting stuff over there, but we're going to start with maybe one of the lesser uh, kind of interactive things, but perhaps one of the key areas is one of our robot storage facilities. So we have lots of robots that we're working with, but not always active. And so we, we tend to kind of cluster them in this corner, neatly arranged. This also gives us a chance to just kind of point at a few robots and talk about them. So this is a Husky robot. It's an outdoor ground robot. This is a Jackal. It's like it's kind of smaller cousin. And, and almost all the robots you're going to see today have a bunch of things in common. So there'll be a robot body that will have some motors that might be joints, that might be wheels, that might be legs. We'll also see sensors on there like cameras for seeing the world or laser scanners, LIDARs, which allow the robot to measure their surroundings. So those kind of sensors are essential to allow the robot to perceive its environment in order to know how to act when it's moving around, when it's interacting with the world. So you'll see a lot more of that from some of the later talks in the demonstration. Uh, over to my left here is our kind of main experimental area for mobile robots. So you can see you pan past there uh, one of the quadrupeds, that's the Animal C. We'll be back and seeing some exciting work with that later. And you can see some more of these quadrupeds sitting in the, the background and a, a biped stood there looking at them. Uh, as part of this environment, we've also got a gantry on the ceiling. So if you look up, there is this kind of yellow metal structure on the roof. From that, we used to actually, we kind of dangle the legged robots to use that to protect them when we're working on new algorithms for helping to control them. If those algorithms have bugs or, or, or go wrong, then the robots might collapse and we use that to actually stop them damaging themselves in the process. So we'll be back in this area at the end of the, the session to, to really see some of these things in action. Oops, I almost tripped. Uh, <laughs> moving away from that, this area is moving more towards the kind of construction and workshop area. So these benches here are where people work on the kind of electronics and mechanics of the robots and also some of the construction. Uh, we can see at the back here, this is another Husky, like the one that was on the floor down there. That's being customized to go out in a, a field, out to an ecological site to survey um, some, uh, some science experiments there. The kind of weird white hat on the top is a radar. So that's a re reasonably novel sensor that we work with on some of our ground robots. If you look over here, we've got two kind of very different types of robots. So this is a, a, a quadruped, so a four-legged robot again, but this is entirely 3D printed and made from an open source design. So this is a robot that anyone with the right equipment can design and build and, and start to work on the control for. At the other extreme is sort of the price range. We have a, a drone that we're using for inspection work in construction sites and also out in the woods again. So this is a flying robot, but you'll see it has similar things. It has lasers, it has cameras, and these kind of uh, sensors are common to almost everything we do in robotics. Moving down through the lab, you'll see you know, more constructions. This is yet another Husky taken apart. 
This is one we use to experiment with to, to test new capabilities. Here we're actually looking at some remote charging for, for a field experiment later in the year. And then if we head down through this way, we can see a few other robots uh, kind of in preparation for some of the experiment work we're going to do. So this blue robot here we call Barney. It's a logistics robot. Uh, we're just working on some of its internals to get it ready to mount some UV lights to work on disinfecting uh, an indoor site within Oxfordshire. So this is a robot that's going to be good at carrying things, moving around. Here we've got another outdoor robot. So this big green mean machine uh, is the Hulk. It's because of its, its greenness and its size. So this is another outdoor robot. The Huskies that we saw earlier have often have quite rough tires and used for really off-road work. Whereas this has smooth tires, and it's actually a modified lawn mowing robot. So it's designed to go safely on manicured lawns like you find at stately homes and, and Oxbridge colleges. And so this is being designed to really do kind of outdoor long-term autonomy in environments which may be not used to having robots. So it's going to be safe and protected, also weatherproof in those kind of environments. So to kind of to keep jumping between extremes, we have our, our final kind of large robot that I want to talk about today. Uh, which is another Husky. This one's been modified to work in excuse me, radioactive environments. So this robot was very recently driving around the outside of the jet fusion reactor, so the jet uh, Taurus in Cullum. So it's been uh, designed by the engineering team here to, to be protected against the kind of radioactive or, or hazardous dusts and gases that come out in the uh, so external areas of this um, reactor. And we've got a bunch of very specialized sensors on the top. So yes, you see the cameras and the LIDARs, but this is a, a radiation sensor. It's used to measuring both the spectra and the activity uh, of radioactive, radioactive sites. And you see this big kind of chunky lump of lead here. That's to make sure that the radiation only goes to this hole so we can count it and measure it in a particular direction. So that's another robot for really hazardous environments, places you can't take humans, which is one of the reasons we build and design these kind of systems. Okay, uh, our final stop. Is, is back in this corner. So I mentioned at the start, we have academics that work on actually constructing and designing robots. So we have a, a particular professor, Perla Maolino, who's gonna talk uh, to you very shortly. And she takes inspiration from nature, from biological systems to look at 3D printing of robots. So we 3D print robots to make them soft and compliant. It means they can move. It means they can be flexible when they're in close proximity, lots of ob obstacles. It also means they're safe. If you interact with one of these and you're a human and you touch it, it's not going to maybe kind of impact on you the same way that an industrial robot arm would. So these 3D printing parts are really exciting. They're really the future of robotics, particularly robots interact with humans. And as I said, they're made by often by 3D printing uh, these kind of materials into robot shapes. So back in this corner, humming away, we have a bunch of high-end 3D printers uh, that Perla and the engineering team used to construct bits of robots and also for some more kind of mundane tasks like actually mounting the sensors onto particular bits of our robots. But this is really an exciting area. And that's why I'm going to hand over now to, to Professor Marolino. And she's going to talk about how she's taking inspira inspiration from nature to build soft robots with a sense of touch. Thank you so much, Nick. And thank you to all of you that are joining us today for our showcase. So as um, I'm going to share my screen and to show you uh, what we do at the, the Soft Robotic Lab, as uh, Nick said, we are part of uh, uh, the ORI. And in particular, uh, my lab uh, um, um, works on uh, uh, two different uh, strands that uh, are uh, related to soft robotics and robotic sense of touch. And you can see here all the people that uh, um, belongs to my group. So we have now uh, two PDRA and, and several PhD students working with me in, in the lab. So the, the reason, as, as Nick said, uh, for uh, soft robotics is uh, actually the biological inspiration. So if we look at uh, biological organisms, we can see how they exploit they, their um, soft bodies to interact safely and uh, uh, for in unpredictable environment uh, and uh, they can really cope with very challenging tasks so as you can see this octopus uh, here in uh, in the bottom then is uh, able to escape from the box very easily thanks to to his uh, soft body but uh, also I mean, we uh, notice that the, the bodies of biological organisms are also um, uh, like, uh, um, uh, so they evolved and they are better uh, suited for uh, cope with the 
uh, environment that they are fitting. But apart from that, the other important aspect that in which I am interested in is the robotic sense of touch. And uh, if we look at uh, um, humans, we use our sense of touch uh, uh, in all our everyday tasks. We use it for manipulation, for grasping, exploration, wood body interaction, but also reactive behavior. And uh, so these uh, are actually driven me to, to think about how we can actually provide robots with these capabilities. And, First of all, the question is why we robots do, do need uh, soft and, uh, and sensitive bodies. And like the reason is that we are used to see robots in a very well constrained environment, uh, uh, manufacturing environment where uh, everything is well defined, where the robots usually need to be very precise and they have to uh, repeat tasks. Uh, repeatedly, uh, while actually we want to uh, move robots and make them effective in an environment that are unpredictable, so our environment, and but also we want them to be uh, flexible, adaptable, and uh, uh, especially we want uh, safe interaction with with human and one them and with the environment. So this reason I started to actually explore uh, during my PhD and uh, in the University of Genova, the, um, the development of tactile sensing technology in particular, I had the opportunity to, to, to work at the development of uh, a large area artificial skin for robots that uh, uh, is called size skin. And you can see here, like uh, taking inspiration from our uh, um, skin, uh, where we have uh, several mechanoreceptors that provide information to the brain about the contact that uh, um, uh, we are involved in. We actually design what is called a flexible printed circuit board or PCB that uh, hosts several uh, transducer. Uh, in this case, uh, in the figures, these are like uh, the green uh, circle that you can see in, uh, in the picture. And uh, this uh, fl flexible PCB can easily conform to any uh, shape, any 3D shape. And so you can uh, uh, cover up to two square meter of the robot body, providing uh, like all the robot with uh, uh, tactile sensing capabilities. Uh, the sensor provides information about the pressure that is uh, on uh, uh, acting on the body of the robot and exploit the capacity transduction that uh, is the same type of uh, uh, transducer that uh, you can find in your phone, for example. But in this case, uh, like the sensor uh, can uh, provide a, a uh, measure uh, of the pressure that is actually acting on, on the robot body. And this uh, uh, um, technology has been also uh, demonstrated and exhibited in, during the robotics uh, uh, exhibition uh, at the Science Museum. We also can demonstrate how the technology can actually um, be able to be uh, integrated on uh, robots with uh, very different uh, shapes. And, uh, and these are uh, several robots that uh, actually we um, uh, used in the past in, uh, in research during the project and, uh, and uh, like how the, the, the sensor uh, have been integrated on all of them. And here you can see the, the sensor uh, integrated on a shunk arm and my colleague here is actually touching the robot so you can have an idea of what uh, providing robots with a sensor touch is about and like in the screen you can see the response of the sensor in particular one what is uh, impressive is that you can uh, easily see uh, and recognize the fingers <laughs> uh, print of, uh, um, of my colleague and uh, the color get darker depending on the pressure that is applying on the, on the robot body. These kind of technologies can really uh, enable robots to do amazing things. In these videos, you can see how the robot that uh, uh, is not provided with vision in this case, and doesn't have any information of the environment that is in front of him. Uh, he just know, um, like the the, the uh, let's say the, where to find the switch at the end that uh, needs to turn on, but he doesn't know where the the pillar are placed uh, uh, and uh, and their size and and uh, and material uh, information. 
So the robot in this case is able to navigate safely without destroying the environment or itself by just exploiting the sense of touch. And, and so these actually uh, show and demonstrate how robots can uh, like safely interact with the environment and, uh, uh, and achieve complex tasks. But also another important capabilities for, uh, for robots uh, uh, is uh, the ability to uh, manipulate objects and so to actually retrieve information that are not related only to their geometrical um, uh, shape, but also to their mechanical properties. In this case, you can see how the, the, this robot with an end of a factor that has been sensorized can uh, easily uh, follow the edge of uh, a mug, for example. So actually recognizing and doing edge detection, what is called edge detection, and uh, can actually follow the, the edge of, uh, of the mug or uh, uh, other objects. So these are important capabilities because the robot can retrieve information for the environment and take decision about um, action to perform in the environment. But as I told you before, we are also interested in exploiting the compliance of the bodies. And in particular, uh, like uh, the, the, the soft robotics uh, uh, philosophy um, actually wanted to uh, achieve better and simple mechanism of exploiting the mechanical intelligence, what we, we define as a mechanical intelligence of the soft material. And to do so, we needed to actually um, look at uh, new uh, fabrication uh, technologies and also new materials, smart materials that can be used for sensing and actuation in order to uh, uh, implement this compliance uh, in, in a soft robot's body. And here you can see several examples. For example, from the point of view of fabrication, we uh, usually use the oil silicon casting, or we can actually, as, as Nick demonstrated before, the, the 3D printing to, to build uh, soft robots. This is also very useful because uh, we can uh, um, easily uh, change the, the design and uh, reprint uh, uh, a new robot depending on the, the, the needs. Also, these are quite a cheap robot. Uh, so, but apart from that, you can also see that we are using uh, uh, like a particular uh, um, material for uh, uh, sensing, in particular, for example, uh, liquid metal or optical fibers. But also we are looking at different methods of actuation. And so, for example, shape memory alloy, that particular material that can be, um, that can change shape depending on the temperature, but also pneumatic, hydraulic actuation, tendon driven. And uh, we have also um, like uh, trying to, to look at uh, other uh, methods, for example, taking inspiration from origami, that is the Japanese uh, art of paper folding, to build structure that uh, um, show uh, some uh, passive intelligence. And uh, like, of course, like all these uh, uh, benefit of exploiting compliance uh, um, in, in soft robot bodies comes with uh, different challenges. In particular, we have to face uh, um, challenges from the point of view of the control because this system can deform in any different way and they can have theoretical infinite degree of freedom. Also, we need uh, to face the problem of uh, uh, designing uh, sensors that are stretchable. So before I show you the artificial skin that is conformable, but is not stretchable. While if we want sensor to be embedded in soft robot body, we need also stretchability. We need also to look at the methods for stiffening the, the body of, of uh, the robot because uh, compliance is good for adaptability. But on the other side, if we want to use the robot to lift heavy object, we need to actually implement mechanism to stiff the robot body. And finally, uh, we want also to look at new material to provide the robot with the self-healing capabilities. So if the robot is actually acting in the environment and you damage itself, you can heal itself without replacement. 
And uh, at the end, we have also uh, the problem of uh, uh, trying to uh, build new methods to um, perform a computation without uh, relying on rigid electronics. So, and to try to put this computation on board of the robot body. So now we show you um, uh, what we are actually doing here at, uh, at the Soft Robotic Lab. In particular, we are looking at the 3D printed soft fluidic actuator for grippers, uh, as you can see in the image. So we are actually looking at using the 3D printer to, 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 to print this uh, um, soft fluidic actuator. And uh, um, here you can see uh, a video that demonstrates the uh, capability of uh, the, the soft grip that we design in uh, the uh, food uh, manipulation. Actually, this, this kind of uh, system uh, are very appealing for uh, uh, like uh, um, agriculture and, uh, and, and food uh, manipulation because we need uh, actually grippers that are delicate and that can deal with a large variability uh, of the object that they have to, 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 to work with. And, and, and so you can also see here, uh, like uh, how the, the gripper adapt to the different uh, um, object. But also here there is uh, um, like a, a, a video of the manufacturing process by using the printer that Nick showed you before. But we don't use also only uh, soft pneumatic actuators. We have also, as I told before, uh, looking at uh, and exploring um, like other uh, uh, methods to achieve this uh, gripper and uh, exploiting compliance. In particular, here we have a gripper that uh, um, is based on uh, uh, what is called the water bomb uh, origami. And you can see like how from the uh, like paper folding, we actually achieve uh, a thick panel origami that has been 3D printed and assembled and, uh, to, in order to uh, reach uh, um, uh, like a, the design of, uh, of, of a gripper that uh, uh, can be actuated with a single motor. And here I show you a video in which uh, uh, you can uh, actually see like how the um, the gripper can uh, uh, grasp and lift several objects. In particular, uh, um, what is interesting is that thanks to the uh, hinges that are soft, the gripper can actually adapt to uh, object of, uh, of different shape quite easily and can, can lift a, a very delicate object, uh, uh, but also a rigid object and uh, um, adapt very easily to, to, to different kind of uh, object geometries. And this is like, uh, this is a glass of water, it's quite heavy, but uh, it's interesting that the, the gripper is able also to actually grasp and lift this, this uh, type of objects. We have also working on uh, the development of a soft arm. In particular, these soft arms are interesting because uh, we can use them to reach a uh, place where rigid robots uh, um, cannot uh, be, be used. And uh, in particular, this soft arm is uh, made of uh, three different links and uh, is uh, provided with uh, a camera at the end. And uh, you can see here how the robot uh, actually can uh, navigate easily thanks to his compliance in a restricted environment. Uh, you can see the obstacles uh, made in wood and uh, uh, on the, the right side, uh, you will see the uh, output from the camera to uh, like uh, uh, make you able to understand what can be uh, seen from, from the robot. And uh, here you have, we have different scenario. In this case, actually the robot is able just to uh, move around uh, to the obstacle. And uh, uh, you can see that the camera is now looking at the ORI logo. But also we have more uh, complex scenarios uh, in which the robot actually pass through the, the two obstacles.
And we have also a, a final scenario in which the obstacles are actually arranged in a more complex way. So, and the robot is able to actually move thanks to its compliance inside and, uh, and uh, look uh, on the other side of the, of the, of the obstacle. And finally, I want to show you something that we are doing also from the point of view of soft sensing. As I told you before, we need a sensor that are uh, very conformable as the robot body actually, and, um, and, uh, and compliant. In this case, we uh, build uh, like a sensor that is an adaptive sensor and is adaptive because we can uh, actually um, uh, uh, change online uh, the uh, pressure that is inside the chamber that you can see here in the picture. And in this way, change uh, the uh, property of the sensor that can uh, be adaptable to the different situation, uh, depending on, uh, on, on the task that uh, the robot uh, needs to, to, to do. Uh, here you can see a video in which, uh, of course, uh, like we, um, this is related to the simulation that we, we, we did to actually look at uh, uh, which kind of uh, um, material to use for uh, uh, this uh, sensor and the response that the sensor uh, could provide with respect to um, different uh, pressure. Here you can see the sensor that uh, and the response from the sensor uh, when it's actually uh, touching different objects. And in particular, what, we, what you can see is the response, as the response change based uh, on the different material that can be chosen to manufacture the sensor itself, but also uh, by, the, by changing what we call the driving pressure. So the pressure that is in, inside the, the chamber of, of the sensor. And so we actually um, try this sensor with different objects, like uh, from like very compliant, as in this case, uh, like this uh, soft bread, uh, to more rigid object to evaluate uh, the, its, uh, its performance. And uh, this is uh, all from my side. So this is uh, all my, my group uh, and that I thank you so much for uh, all the dedication and, uh, and the help that they provide and uh, the research they are doing. And I now stop sharing and then do over again to Nick for uh, the rest of the presentation. Thank you so much for your listening. Cool. Thanks, Perla. It's fantastic work. It's great to see all those exciting soft robots. So we're, we're back in the lab now. Back behind me over there is the Red Animal C preparing for its big demo uh, later on. Um, and please, if you've got questions for Perla, if you've got questions for any of our later presenters, please type them into the chat. We'll get to them at the end. We've already had a few questions coming for Perla. We've got lots more to happen. So please do keep those questions coming in. Um, the, but so what, what Perla was showing us was one way of making robots safe is by making them soft and compliant so you can work around them um, without a risk of physical injury. That's one part of the journey towards deploying autonomous robots in the future. The other part is to make sure we understand and can explain the actions they take when they're operating around us. So our next presentation from Dr. Lars Kunz is going to present his work on explainable and trustworthy autonomy, particularly in the context of kind of scene understanding and perception for autonomous driving. So that's another way that we can think about of understanding robots, which will make them safer and more explainable in the future. So I'm now happy to hand over to Lars. And remember, please get your questions in for him as well while he's talking. Great. Um, thank you very much, Nick. Um, and thanks for joining this afternoon, everyone. I will quickly share my screen. I hope you can all see it now. Um, yeah, so today I would like to give you some insights in our work on intelligent vehicles and also explainable autonomy, as Nick pointed out. Um, so let me start with a brief history of the kind of vehicles we have worked on in the past, so in the last decade. So the Oxford Robotics Institute has quite a track record in kind of developing, but also deploying these vehicles on in real world environments on roads, including the first autonomous vehicles deployed on uh, public roads in the UK that you see in the top left. And we have also worked in various challenges, including the Shell Eco Marathon, 
um, the vehicle that you see in the bottom in the middle, um, which where we have demonstrated autonomous driving on a race course. And today I would like to talk a little bit more about our current platform that we're using in on-road and off-road environments that you see on the bottom right. Um, but before I do this, I would like to discuss and present a few challenges that autonomous vehicles and robots face in general. So most importantly, these robots need to wear, know where they are. So they have to localize themselves within their environment with respect to a map. And also they need to understand what is around them. So they need to understand, for example, here traffic signs and traffic lights. They need to understand pedestrians and they need to detect other vehicles and cyclists. And once they can do this, once they can uh, localize themselves and understand what is around them, they can use this information then for uh, planning their next task or planning their next action and generating uh, motion trajectories. And in the following, I would like to talk a little bit more in depth about the first two questions here. So here you see um, how the localization uh, is working based on a camera image. So on the left hand side, you see live camera image images coming in. And these camera in the camera, camera images, the robot extracts or the vehicle extracts features. And these features are then matched against features in a map or other experience the robot had made earlier. And this matching process is shown on the right hand side here. You see these corresponding features. And this allows us to know where the robot is in every, um, at every moment in time. So we can see in the middle, basically, the previous trajectories the robot has driven, and we can localize the robot here against them. So once we have localized the robot, we also want to understand what is around us. And here you see a very simple segmentation of the environment in terms of the background, which is shown in red on the right-hand side, and the drivable road surface which is shown in green. So this is of course important so that the vehicle understands where it can drive. But of course, here we cannot really relate to any um, rules of the road or regulations because we only know where we can potentially drive. So we need other methods and ways to do this. And we do this um, by using uh, road marking detection Hopefully my slide will move on in a second. So here you, we have trained machine learning algorithms on hundreds and thousands of examples, which allow us to detect now the road marking in various conditions. And this is also very important in the context of intelligent vehicles, that we cannot only operate under some conditions, but that we are working robust, whether it's overcast or whether it's really sunny and we have very strong shadows whether it's wet or raining, or we can operate at night. And um, similarly, we also want to detect other elements in the environment, like, um, for example, traffic lights, um, as you see here in this video. So we only, not only have to detect the traffic light itself, but also its states, of course, in order to um, understand whether we can go or have to stop. Um, we can even, as you see here in front of us, detect them through the van. And this is because these um, traffic lights are already associated with the map. So we have some expectation where these traffic lights will be. And this is also why we can perceive them here through the hedge. And so we, we know already what's coming up and so we can uh, prepare for this. Um, of course, we have to understand the dynamic parts of the road, which includes other agents, vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians. And here you see another machine learning model that was trained based on um, these camera images. And we're able to detect several of these pedestrians and cyclists in these images but you also notice that these detections are sometimes flickering. And this is because the algorithm here works on a frame by frame basis. So it's not taking any uh, history of the images or detections into account, but it's purely on the next image, it's trying to detect them again. But we can improve this by combining this object detection with an object tracker. So we get much more smooth um, uh, tracks of objects and agents here in the scene. 
And this is, of course, very important if you think of intelligent vehicles that are planning the way through the, uh, on the road. So it's really important to understand where the agents are, but also maybe planning ahead what they will do. And this is something that then can be used for our own motion planning and task description. But I won't go into the details today of this. Um, yeah, sorry. Moving on to a slightly different topic on, on top of all the understanding of the localization and the scene understanding. So we also want to build these robots in a way that they are trustworthy. Um, and this is the aim of the Sense Assess Explain project called SAX. And uh, this is part of the Assuring Autonomy International Program at the University of York and the, funded by the Lloyd's Register Foundation. So here we really want to build and uh, create trustworthy systems. And we do this on three main uh, strands. So we want first sense and understand the environment. Then secondly, we want to assess the performance of these vehicles, for example, with respect to their localization capabilities. And thirdly, we want to explain um, the observations and actions, what they are doing and also how well they are doing. And in this project, we want to do this in on-road and off-road environments. We want to use traditional, but also alternative sensing modalities. And we do this across different environmental conditions. Um, again, so here you see our robot platform that we're using for this. And this is equipped with uh, multiple sensors from radar to LIDAR, uh, GPS sensors, of course, cameras, and also microphones. In addition to these environmental sensors, we also record control signals uh, of the driver, braking, steering, acceleration, etc. Um, and this will help us to better make sense, make sense of the data. And we want to deploy these, or in the project, we're deploying these uh, same sensors in different environments um, on the roads in Oxford and London, but also in off road environments uh, like uh, Milton Keynes uh, in an outdoor a facility there and or off-road facility and also in the highlands of Scotland. So I want to give you some impressions of our recent uh, deployment in Scotland that, that we did in March. So you see here the vehicle in the highlands of Scotland and you immediately recognize this is completely a different environment from what I've shown you earlier with respect to the road condition. Of course, we have similar problems of localization and scene understanding. But the problem of understanding what is around the vehicle is completely different. Of course, we want to operate again under different environment conditions like changing weather, and we want to operate uh, during the day and also during the night, night time. And yeah, most importantly, we want to make sense of all the different uh, use of all the different sensors. So here you can nicely see that on the top of the vehicle, the spinning light sensor, which creates points point clouds, which I will also show in a second later on. And here are the cameras of the vehicles that you see that they're using LiDAR sensors in front of the vehicle, the radar that Nick mentioned on top of the vehicle. Of course, we are also using GPS um, for ground truth information, uh, microphones on the wheels, as well as the information from the vehicle itself. We also track the vehicle using this laser tracker and this prism. So we can track this vehicle actually over several kilometers. And this really helps our research in terms of motion estimation, but also uh, localization of the vehicle. So this is of course a very important task, localization, and we can basically acquire ground truth information using these external sensing devices. So, so here you actually see some of the LIDAR scans I was talking earlier. And this is, these are recorded from this spinning device that you saw in the video. Uh, and these are scans from three different types of environments. So one is from London, one is from the Oxford Ring Road, and one is from Scotland. And I guess you can already see a little bit, uh, maybe which environment is which. Uh, because they have quite distinctive features. So you see pedestrians and cyclists in them, you see vehicles, you see more straight structures and also trees in these environments. 
So the challenge here is to develop algorithms that can understand and work and operate in all these different kinds of environments. And this is also one part of the uh, sex project. Here's another sensor. This is now a radar sensor on top of the vehicle. And we're using it in this context for localization again. So earlier I've shown you localization using images where we match the features in the images across other features. Here we're matching scans between features of its units. Uh, different radar scans. And what we want to do is we want to understand how good these scans, scan matches are. So we want to understand when our localization is failing. And this really helps us to make these systems more robust and more safe. Because if we are detecting that a sensor is struggling with uh, the localization, so we can switch to different sensor modality and use a different sensor for the localization like camera or LiDAR. Okay, finally, I want to also motivate why explanations are really important. So explanations for vehicles are really important because we as users or passengers need to trust these systems and we also need to build them in a way that they are accountable. So explanations will help users, operators, developers, uh, accident investigators to make sense of what the vehicle saw. And here I want to show you a quick uh, example uh, where, that we recorded in London, where the vehicle was overtaking, trying to overtake a cyclist. And we, this was done in collaboration with the London Advanced Motorist, and their driving instructor, instructor used a technique called spoken thought, and he is commenting on what he is doing. So I will play the video now. Now I'm on the bend here, so I'm going to move out a little bit early, but not commit myself for the overtakes. I've got the bus and the bollards, and there's a lot going on there. And I've got another bus on the other side and the truck coming. It's just easy to hold back. Let the cyclist take his position. The bus is moving out now. I'll stick it out farther than it should do, so I'm just going to move it out a little bit. And now the bus is indicating. So he's going around the block, which I'm assuming to the cyclist. So the cyclist is moving different speeds. We've got the car coming up. It's going to hold back to see if he's going to go for the overtaking. He is. And the bus is pulling in now on the overtake. Both of them. Go on. Just going to say that the bus is supposed to come in. So this video just shows you kind of a simple maneuver like overtaking another cyclist can be quite complex. And there are many things that have been observed and different interactions within this maneuver. So also, if you want to generate such explanation, either kind of online in the vehicle or post hoc for explanation, we need to do this some way from our sensor data. And here I would quickly want to explain a little bit how we could do this based on an image. So we have this image input and we, what we want is basically a natural language description of some parts of the scene, which maybe say that the current lane only allows us a right turn and that we have to change to the left because the current uh, goal is ahead of us. And so we have to go to the straight lane. Um, and we can do this by interpreting, of course, the road markings and the curbs, as I've explained earlier. And this gives us already a very rich representation of the scene and a better understanding. And we see that some concepts that we, in our natural language explanation, of course, correspond to parts of this interpretation. However, this is all just pixelized on the image. So this is why we have developed algorithms which allow us to generate more powerful representation, and which can be then transformed in natural language explanations. So this is all kind of part of the sex project. Um, we have also a similar project just starting now in this context of trustworthy autonomous system, which is called Road. And this looks more at the ethical, legal, and social implications of the system and the data recordings. So if you're interested in these, please check them out on our website. And with this, I would like to finish my talk. I would like to thank uh, all the collaborators, in particular the mobile robotics group, and also our software and hardware engineers, which made these kind of experiments and trials possible. So with this, I would like to hand over now to Janis, um, and I will stop sharing my screen.
And so over to Janis from the Dynamic um, Systems, uh, Robot Systems Lab uh, for the demonstration. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much Lars for the introduction. I'm Janis from the Dynamic Robot Systems Group. I'm gonna tell you a bit more about the work that we do with leg systems uh, in the lab today. So to start, uh, leg robots come in many different shapes and sizes. For example, we have a number of leg quadrupeds here. Some of them you have seen already. But for example, here we have one of the smaller robots that we have in the lab. This is the Unitry A1 robot. And it's about the size of a spaniel dog. So uh, a small bodied quadruped that uh, we used to do control work on. And here in the back, we have a, a, a larger bodied quadruped as well. This is the animal C from Anibotics. Uh, this is more of the size of a golden retriever, if you like. And the nice thing about leg robots is that the main advantage is that they can operate and do tasks in environments that are generally designed for with humans in mind. So these are example, industrial facilities or you know, business or even even domestic applications where you know the environment is designed for humans. So there's things that you need to step on or step off from. You, there's things that you need to avoid. There's stairs and steps you need to climb and so on. And to, to have a closer look at the animals here, uh, of course, four legs. Each leg has three electric motors. And the nice thing about the particular electric motors here is that they're designed in, in this way so that they can they're able to sense the force that they're exerting on the environment. So it's leg of the system can estimate how much force is uh, putting on the floor here. And this is very important for a control argument because this means that the robot can feel how much force it's using to uh, press on the floor. And then it can sense also when it's making contact or breaking contact with the environment. Apart from its actuation system, uh, of course, as Nick previously mentioned, all our robots come with a set of sensors. So for example, here you can see Animal has a number of cameras, one at the back, one at the front, uh, two, one on each side. And then you have a, a big uh, LiDAR sensor here, which is similar to what Lars described previously, but in a, in a, a smaller sensor and a smaller form factor as well. Uh, so the thing that is, really important for uh, the robot with the, the particular actuation system is that it's, it can use this uh, uh, force sensing so that it can remain compliant and flexible when interacting with humans. For example, if I, if I were to push the robot uh, uh, aside, for example, it would give in to my push and not be rigid. So it would react to my push and you know, remain compliant. So it's very easy to interact with this robot. Now, uh, we're going to switch over to uh, Matthew's screen and have a look at what the robot is seeing at the moment. So here we see a representation of uh, what the robot is perceiving through its set of cameras and the LiDAR. So on the floor, you can see an estimate of the surface around the robot that is being created by working out what each of the four depth cameras is looking at. And then around the robot, you can see points that are returned from the LiDAR, the big sensor here on the top. And these are generally points that are further away from the system. So this would be the walls around the lab. And if you look closely, you would you'd probably see one blob moving around next to it, which is the points that are uh, on me. So uh, let's switch back to the robot. And we can start walking it around. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the work, the research work that we do on controllers. So much of our work is about designing controllers for these robots. Controllers are just computer programs that the robot can use in order to navigate different environments. So for example, a, a controller is a program that takes as input the uh, readings from the cameras and the LiDAR of the system, and then can decide where to place its uh, foot, how high to lift its legs, where to place its, uh, its body, you know, how fast to trot over things and so on. 
there are many ways of building and developing these controllers. The particular example here, this is a learning based controller, meaning that we don't explicitly design what the robot needs to do when encountering this type of uh, environments. Instead, we have the robot try on its own different uh, different actions in a, in, a, in a physically realistic simulator. A simulator is a computer program that we use to uh, have a digital copy of an environment and the robot. And there we can leave this digital copy of the robot to do uh, a series of actions and create a set of experiences over different types of terrain. And from this set of experiences, in essence, understand how it needs to react to different types of environments. So this is, uh, in fact, a reinforcement learning based controller. And we, it, here in ORI, we, we're one of the few groups in the world that uh, are working on this for the quadrupeds. This is uh, most of uh, what I want to tell you about our work here with leg robots. Uh, we can switch over to questions. And Nick. Cool. Thank you. Fantastic demo. And it's amazing to see uh, animal tackling those things using just experience. So this is the robot has learned how to do that from trying multiple times um, in, in simulation. That's transferred to the real robot. So we, we've had a ton of questions. Um, we've got maybe five, 10 minutes to, to go through them. If you've got questions still, please do pop them in the chat. In particular, if you send them to panelists, then we all get to see them and then it's going to be easy to uh, to, to answer them. Um, if you've got other questions that we don't get to, then please do send them to our, to our Twitter account. Um, I think it's at Oxford Robots. It was, it's been mentioned in the chat as well. So we'll also be able to answer your questions after the session um, on that um, on Twitter. And that'll also help if you're watching this, if you're watching the recording afterwards, you can still contact us on Twitter and we can, we can get in touch. Uh, we can answer your questions there. Um, so uh, first question I'm going to pull out. Um, and certainly some very interesting ones. So um, let's go to, there's a question from Sida for Perla, which was what material was used for the arm? So the soft arm that was reaching through all that, that rubble, what, was the, what material was used to make it? We used the Stratasys J735. This is a multi-material 3D printer. Can you, that can you translate that into, into human language, please, Perla? <laughs> yeah, that is the, the name of the printer, actually. So it's a commercial name that <laughs> doesn't have anything with the, with the material itself. But the, the printer itself is a multi-material 3D printer. This means, means that can print um, several materials in, in one batch. And um, uh, like the material is actually provided by is, a, is a, provided by the, the 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 printer itself, so it's a commercial product. Uh, but we don't know actually which uh, material is. So is uh, we have only like the commercial name of them. Uh, ah. But anyway, like this material, uh, actually the the the, the harm. Uh, um, is made with Agilus, that is the name of the material we used, that are usually a very low shore, around uh, um, shore A30, so this is make it very compliant. Could you, what, like, if, if there was a household material, what would that be similar to? Are we talk, is, it, like, is it like rubber? Is it Plastic. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's similar to rubber, like the, the, like the, the type of material is similar to rubber, definitely. Um, and is very compliant uh, uh, and squeezy. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a word I can understand. I can go with, go with squeezy. Cool. Thank you, Perla. Um, Lars, uh, we had a question from Susmita. Susmita, uh, wondering about how the cyclist was tracked in those videos you were showing. Yeah. Um, so very similar to the pedestrians or the vehicles. So you have a detection or you train basically a detection model uh, which can maybe detect various objects. So specifically, you can train one for, for the cyclist or for the pedestrians or the vehicle. And then once you have this first detection, so you're trying to keep track of it. So you're instantiating kind of a pose and a state of this pedestrian or cyclist in particular. You try to follow it using a particular algorithm or, or filter 
which is maybe a Kalman filter or a particle filter. And this allows us to keep track of this position over time and then kind of reaffirm it with uh, later detections as well. Okay, so you, it's not that specific pedestrian. You can recognize it or, or cyclist. You can recognize any cyclist. And then when you've seen one, you track it, you can watch it frame by frame. Is that? Exactly. So we, we are keeping track of the class of uh, different objects like the cyclist or pedestrians. Once we have detected one of these classes, so we create an instance, and then we are following this particular instance over time. Yeah, that's one. And a kind of follow-up question from Stephen. He was wondering about how difficult it is to separate or, or to train a system to recognize a whole object, or, or how, how can a, a system such as that recognition approach separate a whole object versus parts of an object. Do you do you have problems with it just recognizing a wheel or an arm or something, or is it easy to train things to recognize the whole uh, object that you're detecting? Yeah. Um, so I think that depends on, on the kind of training data. So there are definitely approaches which try to detect um, the whole object itself, and then if you want or if you need this kind of more composable model, so you can also train models to detect also parts, for example, if that is really relevant for you, because in the context of autonomous driving, of course, you have to deal with these partial occlusions and you have only partial visibility. Yeah, so that's really important that you can also detect parts of an object or model. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, Yanis, got a good question from Yanis from uh, Prapti. Um, so if, if this controller is, is reinforcement learning, so it's learning through experience, how do you, what happens if it learns something wrong? How do you, how do you debug that, how do you fix it? There are a couple of choices there. So uh, you can either have examples of what it has learned wrong and then uh, retrain on this particular set of examples with a negative reward. So, you know, you'd uh, in a sense uh, steer the controller to avoid this uh, type of uh, uh, behavior that results in negative uh, negative reward, or you'd need to uh, either retrain what you have or train from scratch with a different set of uh, 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 examples, telling the robot you know what what to do. In essence, there are there are approaches in reinforcement learning when you can have positive and negative examples, and uh, you know if if you can uh, recognize one particular behavior or one aspect of the behavior is, is something you want to avoid. You can either add negative examples or uh, have, have a way of telling the robot that you know, it should avoid this uh, type of action. It's more training, basically. If it doesn't mean bad, training, training to do better. More training, yeah. More training. yeah, yeah. Cool, thank you, Yanis. Uh, another question for, for Perla from Nadia. Um, how, like, is, is the, what you present, is that suitable for work in sort of surgery, for example? I mean, the, the technology has been uh, designed to be integrated on uh, robots for, uh, in particular, human-robot interaction and the tactile-based control. I had the opportunity to use the sensor in the context of uh, medical training, for example, integrating just a small uh, uh, module on a probe, for example, for uh, um, particular task uh, uh, in which the robot needed to uh, perform like as the, the medics uh, what is called palpation analysis when, when they actually palpate your abdomen to, to retrieve if everything is, is okay like in, in your organ or if there are some abnormalities. Um, definitely for a surgical environment you need to design sensor ad hoc for that kind of, of task because you need the first of all and this is something interesting from the point of view of soft robotics because you can design for example endoscope that are very soft and so uh, you can avoid to hurt the, the patient's body of course but this calls from uh, new technologies for sensing for example as I demonstrated like soft sensor that can be stretchable or that can be uh, integrated easily in, in a soft body. Mm. I hope this, this answer. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it, effectively anything, so, soft is good in, in the medical context because we don't want to be damaging the things those robots are here. And that's, that's yeah, good. there is a lot of work on soft robotic applied for that kind of, uh, um, that kind of context, yes. Cool, thank you. Oh, question just come in for Lars. I think we'll jump to this one. So uh, for road signal detection, so this is from Ziquan Wang. Uh, for road signal detection, is the current software to detect a traffic light, uh, is it still hard to make a prediction 
on the traffic lights that you can detect. So can you detect what the other cars are going to do around that? Um, and also is the current, so you, you can sort of say, it's, also are the, is the work you're doing tracking the driver's eyes? So when you were talking about the, um, about the, um, when the driver was speaking and driving, are you also considering where the driver is looking at the same time? So maybe answer that one first. That's, that's maybe a clearer question. Mark. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's also a very good point because we can also take some clues where the driver's head orientation is and, and whether he's using maybe some of the mirrors or whether he's looking straight. So that's a third, certainly plan of the project as well. So we, we don't have an eye tracker, so we're not really focusing on the eyes itself. Um, but we have a camera and so we want to aim maybe to get also the head orientation kind of as a signal for that. And what, do you, what do you think that would be used for? Like if you're, if you're tracking their eyesight, what, what important information are you, are you taking from that? Yeah, so, so where the driver pays attention to is really interesting, I think, from our point of view, what objects um, they are or kind of other agents they are detecting, paying attention to and detecting in the kind of perceiving in the scene and then using this information for making their decision. I think that is really informative for us uh, to understand where the driver looks. So hopefully we can learn to expect some information from them. Cool. Okay, uh, that's awesome. I'm, I'm going to keep going. I'm just going to kind of power through questions because there's so many of them coming in that I'm, I'm sort of jumping up and down to the list. So again, if your question doesn't get answered, please check it on Twitter and we'll, we'll try and answer it there. Um, so uh, let's go. Actually, this is a question back to Perla. I thought it was a, lot, a, a Yanis question. Yanis might want to come in as well. So, um, so this is a question from Ellen N. Uh, do you think soft robotics can be applied to creating power assisted clothing? e.g. an exoskeleton assists living heavy objects that's flexible to move around in. So Perla, can we use soft robotics to make uh, exoskeletons? I mean, there are definitely technologies about a soft exosuite that can be used, for example, uh, in rehabilitation. Uh, again, this kind of uh, technologies, uh, so soft robotics uh, can have a huge impact uh, on wearables. And so we can actually definitely uh, build exoskeleton that um, actually uh, can be worn and, uh, by the user and can be used for, uh, in case of, for example, rehabilitation or for other tasks. So definitely, yes, there is a lot of research on that field as well. I mean, it's also quite related to kind of dynamic robot systems. So Yanis, what about the work you're doing? Does that also contribute to the possibility of exoskeletons? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, coming back to the soft robotics uh, side of the question, yes, uh, there, I, I think there are some examples of exoskeletons uh, using this sort of material. Uh, then, uh, yes, I mean, exoskeletons are also uh, a heavily researched subject for like robotics or uh, either of floating weight for, for example, longer treks for people or uh, uh, rehabilitation devices for people that uh, might have the, uh, you know, uh, it might have reduced mobility or even no mobility at all. We have, uh, we have a pro uh, as part of our project, one of our collaborators is working on exactly that, uh, that problem. People that have reduced uh, lower limb mobility, uh, having an exoskeleton that can assist them in regaining back their, uh, their, their, their mobility. Yeah. Hmm. Excellent. So, the, I mean, it's one of the many different ways that robotics can contribute. So you may think about robotics as we're building a physical device to walk around, but you've, you've seen from this, like, yeah, exoskeletons, surgery devices, kind of the work we're doing has, has impact across all of these parts. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to think, start to wrap up now, but I'm going to ask each of you maybe the same question. So it's a, a question that came in from, from Logan, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to actually, okay, no, one more question has just popped in that, that's interesting, maybe one for Yanis, and then I'm going to come to one last for all of you. So this is a question from Kate that says, um, as an OAP, will the, the quadruped be able to help her navigate at home? So are these robots things that you could use within your home? Um, and will it be able to, to maybe warn people if, if, if you fall or something within the home? Exactly, they're, they're, uh, they're already... Uh, people thinking about this sort of application. So uh, instead of, you know, a, a robot that does, for example, heavy lifting in industry, uh, this can be, uh, especially, you know, robots at the size of the A1 that uh, we, we saw earlier, this is more at the size of a robot companion. You can 
walk around your your home and uh, make sure that you know for example elderly, elderly people are uh, don't have trouble with uh, these sort of uh, things uh, you know if they need assistance uh, the robot can inform their uh, uh, the, the relatives that they need assistance or or, or any other uh, sort of a place that uh, they need to, to inform uh, I think it's, I mean, this is the interesting thing. So one of the reasons why quadrupeds are actually applicable for that is because humans, like people's homes have stairs and steps and obstacles and things. So a lot of the okay. historical robotic work has been on wheeled robots with arms, but they're more or less useless in, 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 in your average home. So I think we can see that quadrupeds will be, will be useful um, in these contexts. Okay, l last question for all of you. Um, so I'm going to go around in the same order you spoke, so Perla, Lars and Yanis. Um, and this is a question... Logan asked, but I think it's, it's an interesting one in general. Um, for the things you've presented and maybe the future of robotics, so first to Perla, how much of the behavior of your systems are going to be hand-coded and how much will be learned from experience or data? I mean, in soft robotics, because of uh, like the difficulties of uh, using like classical control approaches, definitely like learning is a good strategy to uh, to make this robot uh, effective. And so, so um, in my opinion, like we needed to push towards more autonomous system that can learn from experience and also uh, adapt to the environment. And so definitely that is uh, uh, one of the way forward and uh, like in my research. Thank you, Perla. Lars, same question to you. How much will be learned? How much will be written by highly paid engineers? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think the answer is maybe somewhere in the middle, kind of a good balance of hand-coded or domain knowledge that you want to integrate in many of the systems, because that's what you have. And I, I would not throw this information away because that's kind of where we build on lots of things. But of course, these systems need to adapt and learn from their own experience. And I think this is where the learning is really strong. And for models that we cannot build, I think learning is really important. But in order to make them interpretable and explainable, I think it's really critical that we relate them to concepts that we have and can relate to. Fantastic. Thank you, Lars. Yanis, final question to you. Making these, these dynamic robots move around your home, how much is learning? How much is programming? Uh, I'm of a similar opinion with, uh, to Lars here. I mean, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of domain knowledge that we have by working on this system for quite some time now. But uh, we see nowadays a lot of uh, uh, learning approaches that cannot perform more traditional control uh, systems. Uh, there's always there's always going to be a need for models and uh, uh, more classical control. But uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, the, the future of uh, uh, robots that coming closer to us are going to use more learning. Especially, uh, you know, parts of the research that uh, have to do with perception, for example, and understanding about the surroundings of the system. These are typically very hard to do in a, in a sort of, in a model, in a more classical or model oriented uh, method way. Mm -hmm. So more learning, uh, even for control. I mean, the, the controller that we demonstrated is a, is a learning based one. And uh, we can already see that this, uh, if these controllers cannot perform more classical approaches already. There's always going to be a combination of both, but uh, yeah. I can see learning approaches currently gaining a lot of momentum. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for awesome contributions today. Um, I think that that's just about all we've got time for. So um, I think that's a great note to end on. So a lot of what we do in the Institute is, is kind of engineering, is building things, is programming things. But part of that work is enabling robots to learn for themselves as well. And, and we have to have this balance of both um, to understand what they can do and enable these robots to do it. So thank you for all your awesome questions. Again, I know we haven't got to half the questions we had in the chat. So please put them on Twitter, uh, drop us a line, get in contact, and we'll do our best to answer them. And yeah, please also look out for the rest of the UK RAS Network's um, Summer of Robotics, lots of other events, lots of other labs and, and demonstrations for you to see if you're interested in these things. All right, brilliant. Thank you very much. See you all very soon. <laughs>